And welcome to Acute News for Panasonic Avionics. And since everyone's sitting on this side, I'm going to walk over here. The guy's trying to get out of the way, huh? Um, like you said, I'm Gary Townsend. I'm a software manager for in-flight entertainment. Uh, just kind of go over a high-level agenda of what I want to discuss today. Uh, first, who is Panasonic Avionics? Uh, second, uh, in-flight entertainment. What is it? I'd like to start with the cabin from the passenger's perspective and then kind of talk about the system, the architecture involved, and then also the services that surround the entire infrastructure. There's a lot of things going outside of the plane that you may not be aware of. That's part of the in-flight entertainment. And then go into the cute effect. I call it the cute effect because we're not really going to be discussing a lot of technical stuff. I can definitely answer te technical questions if you have any, but it's really the ecosystem of the passengers who fly the airlines who's our customers our actual developers and how they're using Qt, and the community and our involvement in that community. Dan will ask some, uh, answer some questions. So about Panasonic Avionics, uh, we are the world leader in in-flight entertainment and communication. Um, right now we're deployed on about 3,200 airplanes and we have about 100 customer base of airlines. Uh, we've been in business for about 33 years in in-flight entertainment. Uh, this will be about my two-year time in, in, in flight entertainment with Panasonic. We are headquartered in Lake Forest. Uh, we have offices in Bothell. Uh, we have a lot of regional centers around the world. Um, our hardware production is in Osaka, Japan. And we have a lot of field satellites, uh, facilities worldwide, about 78 total. Uh, we have about 3,200 employees, uh, of which 150 of them are developers. I'd say probably about 70% of those all are active Qt developers. So in-flight entertainment, what is it? Um, I guess the best way to actually give you a market idea is that we just uh, won an award with Embraer, and I can, uh, or Eddie Hot actually, um, and. Uh, we're just putting a, a Wi-Fi connectivity in their aircraft, and it was a $1.1 billion deal. So if I look at overall uh, the, the deals for the revenue generation, it, it kind of is between companies between $200 million to up to about $4 million per airline. Okay. Information, communication, entertainment. Break it down to those categories on what we serve passengers. Uh, information, uh, the biggest thing is safety announcements. Those little videos that you have to watch to tell you how to buckle up and et cetera. Uh, second one is news, world news, sports. We have live text news. It's changing dynamically as you're in the flight. Uh, airline information, you want to know more about the airline or more about the airplane you're flying in. Uh, that's another way you get information from the IFE system. Route information, where you're flying from, where you're flying to, what's the weather like there, can I book a hotel, let's book a taxi, all that's possible on this in-flight entertainment. Communication, that's probably the largest growing area in in-flight entertainment. You can still get on airplanes 20 years old and be able to watch a movie, but not you can't get on with your laptop and send email. So that's where it's really growing. Email, telephony, um, not only telephony or voice over IP, but we're also installing mobile cell towers on the airplane so you can use your cool new little Nokia N9 phone on that. I'm not showing off, I'm actually hoping for some revenue from that. And also social networking, huge. That feeling of always staying connected. Um, people are married to their phones nowadays, we want to make sure they don't go on a hiatus when they're on the plane. And wireless internet, basically being able to go on with your PED device and connect to the internet while you're on the plane. Entertainment is probably where you spend 90% of your time. Uh, audio and video on demand, it's really big. You can uh, start a video and, and watch it for most of the flight. Uh, we offer a, a large a selection of games as well, and uh, shopping. So all this information, if I give an example of some of the content that's on there, uh, Emirates has about 10,000 line items of content. That is our videos, audio tracks, and games, 10,000. So it's our job to be able to have the passenger be able to experience that smartly, get rid of the stuff that they won't necessarily look at and really emphasize the stuff they will look at. And that's what our interactives do. Our interactives are developed in Cute Quick. Okay, and they run on smart monitors, tablets, handsets, and they're fully customized, meaning that we work with an airplane, no code has been developed at that point in time. We do have some reuse, 
But the idea is we sit with the customers and it's a fully custom solution to that airline. Cabins. Um, some of the, the people that we work with, some of the airlines, uh, if I go to the top left there, that's kind of an economy class. So I'm gonna go ahead and pull this out and simulate an airplane, give you an idea of when we get to these international flights, a lot of people aren't familiarized with the international flights of business and first class, so I kind of wanted to showcase the depth of those different econ uh, classes. So uh, economy class, that first picture in Singapore Airlines, you basically have the monitor in your seat back. And with those, you can have the gesturing capability and it's within reach. And so the input device usually is the actual display itself. We also supplement that because uh, touch is somewhat foreign to some of the flyers, we do give them a basic TV remote too, so they can go in there and do some general channel surfing. Pass that around. Okay, the, the next one. Ready with the other devices? I'll grab another one here. And you can expect to walk in with a ticket of 800 to maybe a couple thousand dollars for an economy class. Um, you go into business class, you can see I just purchased my ticket. I probably spent around $2,000 to $10,000 for a business class trip. The first thing to notice is that the monitor is much larger and it's impossible to touch. It's way out there. So that's some of the challenges is how do we allow that user to interact with that? It's an interactive, but it's way out there. So you can see right here in the kind of the center is this tablet. It's wireless, so it basically sits right here. I don't actually have the housing, but it's the same hardware. That's a tablet. So they can just take that, remove that, and it's kind of like a big universal remote for being able to get to all the content. That's one of them. The second one, sorry. Uh, it's a fully smart uh, monitor. So it's an OMAP3 processor. It's a gigahertz. Yeah, and a gigahertz, uh, or a one gig of RAM. Yeah. So the, <coughs> the other handset that you'll see is basically it's a game pad, and you'll see these in the business class. And some, first, or some economy class actually has these game pads as well. Uh, one of the comments was, it's kind of annoying that you introduce gestures and they're sitting there slapping my chair the entire time. So this is another alternative. You can play games on this, and it's also used as a control device for the big screen. At any time, it also can be modified to be a keyboard, or uh, we also use it as a way to navigate the, through a mouse cursor using it as a touchpad. So there's a lot of different ways that we utilize that. Sorry. It does look a lot like a PSP, yes. Okay, and, and one of the airlines that we do have domestically that you guys are aware of in the Bay Area is uh, Virgin American. The, the red interactive is Panasonic's. Um, so let's go to the system. So we kind of see how the passenger experience is, but what's actually involved in creating the system? There's basically a head end that sits up at the front of the cabin, and it has two different servers. One's the IFE controller, which is basically the brains of the entire system. That's where it connects to the aircraft uh, interface, and we gather geo-navigational location information. We can get flight speed. Uh, also, if there's any transient data, such as a passenger address, cabin needs to say something, he pushes that, it goes through the AN, gets distributed through the network. The other one's a content server. Content server can store anywhere from two terabytes to 10 terabytes of information. And that's where all of your audio and your video resides and also the streaming capability. The last one on the head end, which is cute driven, is the crew panel. Uh, the crew panel is basically just an administrative panel for crew members and flight attendants. Uh, they can look at, um, uh, assistant request or, or they can do online ordering requests for the duty-free stuff. They can do uh, parental locks on certain seats. They can do seat resets. Uh, they can do uh, log, this administrative panel. All that information gets pushed into an ethernet switch from the controller and the crew panel, you're talking about gigabit. And from the content server, you're talking fiber optics. After that ethernet switch, it will basically go to down basically the cabin on both sides and each row there will be a seat electronic box. That seat electronic box acts as a switch to deliver the network connectivity to the row of seats as well as power. So there's one of those seat electronic box per row. Uh, also for redundancy 
any of these can be duplicated. So you can have four content servers and two IFE controllers. The content server doesn't mean it's just one PC. It's a blade makeup. Yeah. In fact, uh, the previous one, this is actually the EX3 system. It's a new one. The previous one had uh, an aircraft interface. It had a file server, a disk array, and a media server. And the media server was duplicated. So in EX3, we took a lot of those and compressed it down for weight and size. Yeah. The uh, QT version we use is 472 currently. Yeah, and we're already doing uh, four eight deliverables next year, and our R and D team is deep into Qt five zero that's running on our product line. Uh, we're running on Linux. Uh, we do have a couple that are Windows CE, I and um, both ARM and Atom based processors, and we can get into a little bit more of that too. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, I understand the frustration. I travel a lot trying to sell these things, and I'm frustrated by the IFEs too. A lot of the IFEs that you guys are using, and I can get into that a little bit later, but our um, life cycle for hardware is 20 to 30 years. So the ones that you're probably looking at are 15 years old. Um, a lot of that technology was just browser-based. It was a server-client connectivity, and not a lot of stuff was pushed locally. And the smarts wasn't really at the seats like they are today. In fact, a lot of stuff that I'm discussing today, they'll start early rollout at the beginning of next year. And that's another very strong point for using Qt, is that we have to make 20-year-old hardware look like the tablets that people are running around with today. Okay, services. So now I'm going outside of the cabin, and I'm looking at all the different services that also are available in the in-flight entertainment. First of all, we have satellite, cell phone, and Wi-Fi. All three, while it's on the gr ground, it has Wi-Fi. Up to 10,000 feet, we have cell. Anything above 10,000 feet, we can now do satellite. We are on KU band, so we're looking at about 1.5 gigabits. Um, all three of those together give that seamless feeling of uh, connectivity. Also on that, it all feeds into a mission control. And the mission control is really cool. Of walking into Lake Forest, walking into mission control, looks just like something out of Minority Report or something. Huge monitors all over the wall. And it will register all planes that are flying all throughout the world. And as soon as an application freezes or a seat locks up or anything, they're alerted of that. And they can actually diagnose that um, on the ground and reset it. Now, this is just an option of fully connected planes. So you're going to see that start rolling out. But we're trying to take all the guesswork out of the, the crew. Because what the crew does, one goes down, they reboot the entire system. So we're trying to get away from that. Um, and the other side of that, of the data center, is we're also gathering a lot of information, report generation and stuff. From the airline operation, an uh, airline can log in and say what movies are being watched, which audio is being listened to, what is the rating on these things. And in that same website, they can manage their content for poll information or metadata that they want to supply or language support. And they also have, uh, it almost looks like iTunes, they can go in and select what uh, movies they want, what audios they want, and stuff to push in the next media load. That uh, content and software media load happens about once a month, so they can go and do that audio, that ordering. So they take all those reports and kind of feed it back in to see what would be interesting to their passengers. Okay, so that gives an overview of kind of what IFE is in its entirety. Um, so what's Qt's impact on that? Uh, I said I wouldn't go into anything technical, so I want to talk about how is it affecting the passengers? How is it affecting the airlines, our customers? Uh, how is it affecting the development team at Panasonic and third parties? And then last, uh, how is it affecting the community? And how do we want to get involved in the community? So I'm going back to passengers. Uh, the user experience has changed dramatically over the last couple years. Um, I was talking to one of my colleagues, and he says, you see people walking down the street now, and instead of pushing buttons, they're all swiping or navigating this way and stuff. And everyone has tablets or some type of smartphone or has experience with it. So they're expecting that same um, performance. They're expecting that same user interface. And no longer are people just happy with tons of content, but they want to have fun finding that content. Uh, Qt really gives us a lot of that capability, even in the Qt Quick. So the modern user interface and the gestures. Uh, virtual reality, 3D, 
it's in our R&D team right now, but it's a way that you can really immerse yourself inside the interactive. You can look this way, grab something, and play it here. Uh, that's in the, com the most complex version. The simple version is just taking what's already available, scrolling through a list view, and then adding some dynamic shadowing onto it. Maybe tilt it a little bit, make it look boxy. Augmented reality. Uh, our R&D team surprised me just not too long ago. In fact, I had to add this onto the slide. Uh, we have bottom-facing cameras, side-facing cameras, front-facing cameras. And they took the bottom-view camera, showcased it over the Grand Canyon, and had points of interest actually tracking on that camera. Okay, and I was like, okay, that's cool. Already been done, you know, challenge them a little bit more. So then they put live Twitter feeds in there. So you can sit there and watch the Grand Canyon and see people talk about different landmarks and stuff. And I probably spent two hours just watching the simulator. Cool, look at that. You know, look at the fish he caught, you know? And so it really connects. <clears throat> and of course, the multiple devices. Passengers are going to use and experience many different devices depending on where they're sitting on that class and the ones that are passing around the room. Okay, airlines. This is one of the things that we're extremely happy that Qt has. In fact, we say that we sell Qt product, cute software. We don't hide it by different names. But first of all, it was like Excite uh, and Experience and all this stuff. We said, let's just call it cute. Why? Because we were able to take a lot of the engineering out of it and focus directly on the design, what the airlines want, their envisionment. Also that we had extreme turnaround. Um, just give you an example. We'll do some role play. You guys will be the airlines and I'll be Panasonic. Previous to cute, they basically said, here's our requirements document probably about 100 pages, line item of every little graphic, every little transition that's going to happen. And they hand it over to the marketing team, and they hand it over to the design team, and they hand it over to me, and I throw it over the wall to a third party. Eight months later, what they get? Something close, but nothing they're really happy with. Um, so what we're doing with Qt now is we have uh, engineers, we'll get into it, that are called customer focals. And they actually walk into these meetings with the Qt creator um, in hand with the airlines and with the designers. The designers are the ones that take the inspiration from the airlines and build it in Photoshop. Our Qt creator teams are sitting there mocking it up in the fly and then giving them the, the idea of how it's going to look on the actual device. After that, we start uh, iterative development. Uh, we have simulators, so they can run on Windows, Apple. We even have it running on Android, so we can give them a tablet, which is pretty close. And then we can also give them the device itself. And every couple of weeks, we'll actually give them a drop. They'll give us feedback. We'll put it in our backlog and make sure it gets into the next cycle. So we've been working a lot closer. Um, it actually has a lot less lead time now because we don't have a lot of fix-up work after we're done. Um, multiple monitor deployment. Beforehand, if there was a lot of different monitors in the cabin, we'd have to develop software specifically to each one. And with Acute Quick now, the ability to anchor for different resolution sizes. So if I was to take the resolution and stretch it, certain things would stick to the corners or certain things would stay center. Uh, it's very important for the airline because we can code it once and it'll automatically adjust to different resolutions. And the other thing is um, we can change just with a couple of different property binding the economy class is going to have a little bit slower processor, maybe not have as much animations, flip over a switch, same code base, and have economy or business and first class really accelerate it, get that 3D and, and fluid motion out of it. Post-delivery. So that was all during development. So what can Qt do after delivery? Okay, the bane, kind of the curse word in the airline industry is ATP. It's an acceptance test procedure. Basically, if I touch anything in compiled code, it has to go through a full regression test. That involves recreating the airline in one of our racks. That means 200 to 600 different displays that have to be um, uh, loaded onto the rack, loaded with the software, and then they have to go down the entire uh, ATP. Um, you'd think we'd have a streamlined, but it's still four months to two years turnaround time. So if I have one of these guys paying $1.1 billion coming in and saying, I'd like to change my background, sure, 12 months later, you can have it. It's not going to cut it anymore. So uh, the fact that QML inherently is content bypasses a lot of that issue. So we can run the ATP at our framework and our engine layer, verify it on all the different uh, QML elements that we expose, verify the framework, and then we're free to adjust the QML without going through the full ATP process. Uh, Long-term support and stability. Uh, 
Of course, we talked a little bit earlier about how I can run CUDA on the old units and how they stay in circulation so much longer than a cell phone. And the bane of our IFE is dark flights. What's a dark flight? Let's say I'm at home and I'm watching TV and the TV goes out. I just walk to my computer, I start surfing, it goes out. Maybe eat something and go out and play a baseball game or something. Okay, I, I start my flight from LAX to Dubai, 16 hour flight, two hours later, the entire system goes down. What do I do? I pull out my dope pad and start writing cuss words, you know. I start talking to CEOs, I start talking to Panasonic. You guys know my face now, you start talking to me. We don't like that, so the stability really helps us with Qt. You guys have a long reputation of stability and we've been leveraging that technology. Um, and, and plus a lot of third party development, they just can't get in trouble like they used to with the declarative language. Uh, theme management, that's uh, very similar to a property binding. It's basically we push out all of our interactives today with themes in mind. So they can say primary color goes from blue to red and it automatically goes through all the property binding and anything that was a primary color and it changed it from blue to red. We have a tool that allows them to do that. They can actually take a laptop onto the plane, connect to a seat and make changes live, say they have information, post it on their website and have it available to the next content load. Those themes can be changed dynamically. So on my route from LAX, it can have a background of LAX and halfway through to Dubai, it switches themes. Very similar to like an operating system today, switching themes. Uh, content management, uh, all kinds of different content gets feeded in here that we have to show through the, the user interface. RSS feeds, Atom feeds, XML, JSON, Qt handles that for us. So we just dump it over to a model and we handle them all the same way. Okay, developers, how is it affecting developers? Uh, customer focals, those are the ones I talked about earlier. They're in with the very first envisionment of the product and they work with the airline through its entirety. So after they're done with the initial design, They'll actually use the Qt analyzer tool and they'll uh, analyze our third party development to make sure we're getting it as, as efficient as possible. The other thing they do is look at that development and say, this is a great piece of code, let's pull it out and put it in our reuse library. So when the next customer comes along, we'll give them the whole entire suite of uh, pre-developed QML components to work with. So we're sustaining a reuse library on that. Um, this is some of the reuse stuff that we've pulled so far. And they also act as forum support. So they're kind of the tier one for any type of questions that our third party developers have. Interactive developers. This most of the time is the third party development that's doing the actual QML development for the interactive. Uh, it's all done in QML. If they do need an additional plugin or something, we develop it and release it through our side. The purpose is, is any new third party that we bring involved, they don't have to worry about compiling anything that is right to QML. We also give them all the simulators and stuff available to us, to them, so they can actually test it while they're doing development. Application development is kind of tricky. Application really means widget. There's a lot of these things that are drag and drop that we can pull into different interactives. Um, seat chat, social networking, we have like world clock. Uh, we have some QML games, I'll get into that later. Um, but you can pull them in, put a different theme and, and start reusing that as well. Framework developers. Uh, these guys are the ones that are creating the engines or the main uh, entry point. Um, that we have target uh, specific ones because we do change some of the flags to in the OpenGL to really get as much performance as we can. So there are different engines for our different platforms. Simulation, not only does simulation run in QML on the desktop, but it also simulates a lot of the events that you get in IFE. So you can do a passenger address to see what a pause video and stuff would look like. We did that in the mind to give it to the customer so they can be part of the process, but what we gained out of it was actually handing that off to training facilities. So the, the, the crew and stuff that are going to be experiencing the crew terminal or issues that may come up in the in-flight entertainment, they can actually use those emulators and we can force that uh, critical fault to happen so they know how to handle it. Um, QT plugins, that's our way of taking functionality from our IFE system and it turned them into QML components. We have about 60 different ones. These are the ones that you can grab me by the collar later on and ask me questions on. I've put some of the ones up there. Um, telephony, making a phone call. We have uh, our own media player, a media playlist. Um, display controller, audio mixers, uh, iPod integration. 
Uh, we have different models that we use as well. Uh, we can pull ID3 tags from MP3 files for uh, USB media drives. And configuration tools, kind of talked about the theme manager. That team is responsible for that. All this is built into a very user-friendly SDK. Um, Panasonic is going with this idea of open platform. We want to engage third parties such as ICS. We want to engage other um, uh, Nokia partnerships and say, hey, we're going to give you something that you're super familiar with, QML. And we're going to give you a development kit and simulation that allows you to start developing. Uh, this is just kind of an example of pointing to some of the different QML elements that we have. You can just think of this as a display. The top would be a web view. Maybe it's an advertisement bar that we pull from a database. It's all in HTML. It's ready to go inside the interactive. Viewports where we'd actually play our video. It's, it's hardware mixed, so it would actually be uh, decrypted on DSP and then just put it as an overlay. That's just the location of it. Uh, maybe you have a carousel path view. We're loading it from a SQLite database that's pushed locally to the seat so we don't have to do server calls. You have the media player and media playlist, uh, different ways of being able to organize media. In fact, we use a serializer on the media playlist so they can save it on their USB, get off one plane, get it on another, and load up where they left off on their playlist. And the launcher is just a way of launching games that may not be built into the interactive. Uh, we also have uh, communication between like the handsets. That's all done in QML, well, QML as well. And some background tasks that may be working. Research and development. Very fortunate with Panasonic to have a good research and development team. A lot of companies don't get that privilege of someone looking one year, two years out. This is where a lot of the communication and the community with the cute resources is going to come in. I have already had uh, relationships with some of our developers and some of the cute staff that we're working together. Uh, what we pull from them is their knowledge of the framework. What we give back is some examples that they can use and also some of the bugs and features that we would like to see implemented. And hopefully soon we can actually fix them ourselves. So research and development, cute 3D, cute shaders. Uh, this particular image right here kind of utilizes all that. This right here is a rippling water, and this is just kind of like the front page when you sit down, this is what you see. We have rippling water here, we're using particle systems, it's hard to see, but these leaves are all being blowed off as though there's an illusionary wind sweeping through. The clouds will slowly move, the light source will move, and it will cast different lighting effects depending on the terrain. So we're really utilizing as much as we can on that QML. Um, game development, uh, I don't know what to do with my developers. It seems like every time I task them with learning a new functionality, they want to go out and build another game. So we have like f at least a shelf of four different Atari games remade. And uh, those are all being planned on being posted directly to the community site so you guys can pull those down and play with the games that they're developing. Um, nice thing about R&D is they're not usually working to customer deliverables, so they kind of have the freedom of being able to play around with concepts, and we can push that back to the community without worrying about any repercussions from customers. Uh, QML input. I might get in trouble on some of this so it doesn't leave the room. I'll make sure Adam enforces that. QML input. Accelerometer. We have accelerometer on these little PlayStation portable devices. Uh, we have inputs to QML that allows us to use that as a control mechanism. Uh, gestures, that's already built in, but we've been doing some uh, modification of the framework to really optimize multi-touch, so instead of two, five. Um, connect, we do have working connect. One of the situations I said in business class, six feet away, now you can control it with your hand. We do have that working. And voice recognition is another one. Uh, a lot of uh, premium and first class actually have headphones, so we give them voice command. So they can say music and it'll show it, play one. And that's another input device that we're bridging over to QML. So the Cute project, I kind of already discussed all this. One of the things that we found out just by accidental is that we're creating this platform. And we have a lot of customers that are coming in and a lot of third parties that are interested in bidding on working for those customers. We're building a platform and saying you guys are using QML. And what that's doing right there is getting them in that mindset to where they want to go to the community and learn more about QML and become QML experts. And while I've been here so far, I've had a lot of people come up to me from, um, that are coming here just getting involved with QML, saying, hey, what should I learn, you know, so I can get involved in developing from some of your airlines? It is pretty lucrative right now. They're paying a lot of money to be on the bleeding edge of in-flight entertainment. So that was one of the things that we're basically encouraging third-party development to learn this 
and to feed it back. So session feedback. Go on there, vote. I was required to say that. I picked the pink phone, it's graceful. Any questions? That's a pretty quick shot of this book is also keeps you value for the time. You mentioned that you have a very, very long market time. Are you also planning to take this huge phase that you're doing for the old topography issue? We have three different, what I think, systems. We have the old legacy system that needs a refresh, and we're using Qt on that and QML. Uh, we have the hybrid systems, which they're just going in and replacing business and first class with new hardware, but they're not replacing the economy class. Uh, we have Qt running on the old one to give it the refresh, and some of our new hardware actually comes with the Android system. We're using the same Qt that runs on top of the Android. Um, and then we have the, the newer model ones that we're really looking for, the Qt 5, so we can start going into the 3D with the shaders and stuff. I think the first customer is looking at uh, Q3, Q4 of 2013, so we can get the Qt 5 stuff as mature as possible to deliver into them. Good question. Any other questions? How can I get a first class ticket somewhere? Is there, a, is there much interest or, uh, or any dynamic for uh, a, a kind of a monitor mode um, for customer devices or kind of where you'd have your own customer device but the seat back or the system would... Yeah. Uh, In fact, they're right here. So we have a standard, I think this is S-Video, but these are actually modular, whoa. These are actually modular, so we can replace these. Uh, the first, we have two iPod uh, integrations. First one we call is uh, iPod Phase 1. It's basically describing exactly what you said. You can take an AV input, put it directly to the monitor and watch it. And the Phase 2 is actually that you can drive the iPod itself through the interface. So we do offer both those. Do you see that as a growing thing in the industry? I mean, how does, how does the airline industry see that? Do they see it as a desirable thing or, uh, or, or not desirable? Uh, most definitely they look at it as desirable because people are bringing on their own tablets and stuff and they want to be able to do that. And there's a, some revenue generation opportunities there as well because they have a lot of media on that plane that's in theaters that you can't purchase elsewhere. So we're already working with some of the media labs and saying, hey, why don't you allow them to purchase it there, put it on their PED device and walk off the plane. Um, there's even more trends uh, happening too that's saying uh, United Airlines is an example. We gave them a full wireless solution. So across all the fleet, United is going to have a wired solution. But they're not necessarily going to have our hardware on it besides the wireless. So can't tell you much more, but you can kind of go from where that is what's going to be actually in the seat back. So um, you're looking at, in the future, uh, creative ways of being able to uh, show IFE without having the seat back or the monitor in every seat back. Um, so to, for Panasonic to be proactive, we're looking a lot at the service capability that we can do as well as some of the application development. Uh, with full connectivity, you're talking about applications you can download. Um, being able to be on the ground, book your tickets as soon as you get on the plane, it'd be active and be able to see a map, and at the end, being able to do rate and purchasing. Yeah. I was, I was interested by your description of the plane with its complete uh, network. Mm -hmm. It's almost starting to look like a sort of a traditional web app environment where you can, uh, you know, sort of have a whole community where people are obviously pulling down content that they're consuming but then pushing back with uh, their own feedback. So can you see, for example, which movies are popular, or even better, which interfaces are actually working better than which other interfaces? Yeah, we have a, a lot of logging, especially when the mission control got launched. Some of the things that we have to do is log, um, not only rating, but we have a concept of genius. It's very similar to the iPhone uh, and the Apple. If you do what Apple does, you're basically going to be successful. That's our philosophy anyways. But um, all that information that we're gathering, the reports from what's being viewed, what people are doing, what social network uh, applications are doing, what games they're playing, is all being fed back um, to that central server and being pushed to that mission control. We're taking that information, giving it to reports to airlines, 
but we have this thing called passenger data integration, which is basically binding that experience to a passenger so we can guess what he would like to see on the next flight. So when he gets behind a seat, he'll say, welcome, Johnny. Um, we noticed that you liked comedy. Would you think about watching these that are uh, online? Um, but to go back to the server client, it definitely was a full server client setup before. We still do that today. Uh, one of the big changes is we push all metadata locally because we have the space, so the performance is much better. We don't have everyone hitting the head end. And we also are looking at full peer-to-peer -peer networking systems. So not everyone has to hit the server. People can actually ask their um, sibling next to them to start streaming them a video as well. So we have a lot of opportunities there. Okay. So, um, just that last use case, have you, have you thought about um, mobile devices as controllers for the screen and situations where you have brother and sister sitting next to each other sharing a screen and trying to do games or maybe even across screens? We have a board that we all go to in our little war room area where we all put down different ideas and stuff and that one's come up a often. We actually step back and look at all these ideas and say how can we, Panasonic, 150 engineers, develop all these and have them active and, and, and competitive. And a route that we decided to go is to go with an open platform. So you're going to see the SDK for Qt and also you're going to see it for Android and iOS coming out and we're going to say let the ecosystem run wild for it. So we're going to be exposing a lot of interfaces, such as control interfaces. And it may take a certain amount of certification to say uh, your company has access to this interface. But yeah, go ahead. If you want to create it, maybe you'll be the first one to develop it. Yeah, it's uh, all the time. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you.